America's never seen anything like it. The Gulf of Mexico is suffocating under a sheen of filth. Oil stretches as far as the eye can see and beyond. It covers an area the size of Scotland. More than two million gallons of oil a day are still erupting out from the deep. And the vast swathes of Greece are on the move, shifting in the currents inexorably closer to America's shores. Well, we're flying right over the site of the explosion now. All that equipment is being used to try to stop the gush of oil from under the sea. That flame over there is some of the gases that are still coming up, being burned off. We've flown over miles and miles of sea oil absolutely everywhere. What scientists are really worried about, though, is what's happening deep under the ocean. Right near here, they found one plume of oil that they say is 12 miles long and 600 feet thick. So the scale of this really is staggering. 41 miles off the coast of Louisiana, one of the most impressive oil rigs in the world once towered over the Gulf of Mexico. It was called the Deepwater Horizon. At 2.30 p.m. on April 20th, BP's regional vice president for drilling and executives from Transocean, which owned the rig, visited. They came partly to celebrate. The rig was drilling fantastically deep through a mile of water and down into two miles of earth where untapped riches lay. The deep water horizon was pushing the frontiers of technology. Drilling this deep is dangerous. They were celebrating seven years with no accidents. We were proud of what we do. Um, we were known as one of the better rigs out there in a, in a fleet. Um, we we did take pride in what we did every day. That day, the rig workers had a job to finish, and fast. They had to seal the well so production could start. The rig cost BP half a million dollars a day to run, and they were way behind schedule. Hey, smile, Dustin, you're on camera. Woo! Near the bottom of the rig, four young men were out fishing. A few weeks ago, this was a great spot for big game fish. As night fell, they let their boat drift right under the rig. We were catching fish, having a good time. And all of a sudden, the rig started making this loud hissing noise, like pressure being released, and, and water started coming and falling from the derrick out the middle of the rig. Wesley, a former rig worker, knew it was gas. As soon as I heard the gas rushing out, I looked up and I, I saw the top of the derrick, and. I screamed, go, 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 I mean, as loud as I could. You, we looked back and you could see just a cloud of gas surrounding the whole rig. At about 9.45, an explosive mixture of drilling mud, gas, and oil burst up through the rig's center. Clouds of gas enveloped the rig, and then, for those on board, the nightmare began. When it exploded, it was just one big ball of fire. Just the force of it come towards me, and when it hit me, it just knocked me all the way back to the cab of the crane. And uh, when I hit the cab, I just put my hands over my head and fell to the floor, and thinking that, thinking that was, <clears throat> thinking that was it for me. The rig just started just shaking. You know, it was, it was, I can't even explain in words how that felt. Couldn't see, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. It was so dark. The flames went over my cow. When it all blew up, it just blew out and then up the derrick. There was a whole bunch of smoke and insulation that just came running into our room. You could smell gas and I didn't think no one made it from out those rooms at all. The men tried to escape but the gas was spreading through the rig. Explosions thundered one after the other. I started down the spiral stairs and that's when something else on the back deck exploded and it blew me off about 10 feet or so in the air onto the deck and I hit on my chest and, and my hands. Steve and Tyrone were trapped downstairs. The sleeping quarters were starting to bake under the roaring flames. It was like a, like a crematory 
like an oven, you know? I'm gonna die here. I'll never forget the sounds, the feel, the taste. It was horrid, horrid. When I ran to lifeboats, I was just running. People screaming, just chaos. Um, trying to load in the lifeboats. You'd see people stand at the edge and just jump, just out of, out of fear. But you'd turn around and you'd look at that 400 foot flame behind you and all the explosions, all, the, all that's going on, and you understood why they jumped. Micah, Tyrone, and Steve made it to the rig supply ship, the Damon B. Bankston, nearby. They watched as the Inferno consumed the rig. Eleven of their colleagues were still on it. And just sitting there watching the rig burn and the guys that are on the rig that were left burning and dying, I've been with them for eight years on that rig. And, you know, we worked three weeks and three weeks. I, I'm, I'm with them six months and my family six months. They're like a family to me. As the rig went down, two survivors on the supply ship heard a Transocean manager making a phone call. They relayed the story to their lawyer. Jimmy Harrell, they said, shouted at his bosses. We don't know if he was talking to BP or Transocean, but he didn't mince his words. Harrell said the disaster was predictable. He was on a satellite telephone talking to headquarters in Houston, and he was, he was saying, um, are you happy? Uh, it happened. I told you it was going to happen. I am calm. Don't tell me to calm down. The rig is burning. Do you understand what happened here? Uh, I told you this was going to happen. BP says it's aware of the allegation, but won't comment whilst investigations are ongoing. Transocean says it's not commenting on what has been said by individuals. Over three miles down, the well had burst, and a monster was unleashed. BP's first estimates were that this was bad, but controllable. They told the world the well was leaking about 35,000 gallons of oil a day. The Obama administration initially went along with this. It would come back to haunt them. Everything we can see at the moment suggests that the overall environmental impacts of this will be very, very modest. Since the disaster, the oil has spread like a disease. I went down to the fishing villages of southern Louisiana to see for myself. They were like ghost towns. No fishing, no tourists. This is the worst hit area. They can close all four, add more pressure. And Tony Hayward, the CEO of BP, says they hope to get 90% of the oil out, but no one's really relying on that just yet. We're gonna have to wait and see. The region's made up of miles of shallow water, famous for shrimp and oysters. Down here, the land is interspersed with wild marshes, beaches, and inlets. These unique wetlands have been coveted as a home to rare birds and animals. And look at them now. Fishermen told us they'd seen oil eight inches thick. Some of the black goo has separated and floats in slimy clods. Millions of gallons of the dark poison saturate the water. This a glimpse of what the fish eat and breathe now. We're 43 miles here from the place where the oil has been spewing out of the pipe. And as you can see, it's still really thick. This whole area absolutely stinks. It smells like petrol. And the point of this boom is to stop the oil from hitting the coastline, but all it takes is one little wave and it slurps right over. You can see the stained grass over there. And of course, this is devastating for the wildlife. Moira Wood has spent years working to protect these marshes. But with the oil coming in in waves now, she says there's no point in even trying to clean this grass. Her worst fear is for the rare species decades from now. Well, we know from our experience with the Exxon Valdez that some species have recovered completely, that some species are still recovering, and that some species have not recovered at all. And that's 20 years later. 
The Gulf is one of the only places you'll ever see this rare sea turtle, and the sea turtles here have been drinking the oil. Brown pelicans can barely move in their new world of stinking sludge. It's hard for them to fish and breed now, and these birds just got off the endangered list. Nearby, Billy Nungesser, who runs the parish with the longest coastline in Louisiana, was on the warpath. He was hoarse from weeks of shouting about what he sees as the slow response all around to a crisis he regards as worse than Hurricane Katrina five years ago. Billy wants BP to build a giant sand wall along the coastline. He was angry at the delay. The most incredible thing today is, here we're here two weeks later, and we're seeing another part of South Louisiana devastated with all Southeast Pass. Breaks my heart. BP has now committed millions of dollars to build the sand wall, but for Billy, it's too little, too late. We're in the fight of our life. This is worse than 10 Katrinas. Why do you say that? Because it could go on for many years. Imagine having a Katrina every week for 10 years. It all continues to come ashore as we stand here. It's destroying another piece of coastal Louisiana. Well, BP says they're doing everything they can to clean up the mess. That's you an absolute it. lie. Absolute lie. Everything they can, they've been forced to pay for the berm. I wouldn't have had to go to Arkansas and find 100 skimmers. That's BP's job. I don't mind doing it, but damn it, step up to the plate and pay for it. On May 27th came news that shook America. Officials concluded that 10 to 20 times more oil had been gushing out a day than first stated. And all the efforts to stop the never-ending eruption so far had failed. With the growing cacophony of anger, the penny finally dropped at the White House. This could be the biggest crisis of the Obama presidency. President Obama was playing catch-up. He needed to deflect growing criticisms of his role, so he let rip against BP. Teams of experts, he said, would help him hunt down the guilty. I want to know why. The American people deserve to know why. The families I met with last week who lost their loved ones in the explosion. These families deserve to know why. And make no mistake, all this is costing BP dear. They've hired thousands of local workers and boats and paid for millions of feet of boom. In the 63 days since the disaster, BP spent $1.75 billion on the cleanup and compensation and committed $20 billion more dollars to a separate fund. I wanted to find out if all this money was working. Well, all this shows you just how painstaking and difficult it is to clean up oil. I'm standing here at the site of the biggest oil spill in America's history, and they're cleaning it up with shovels and their hands and putting the oil into bin bags. The scale of all this and BP's early decision to play it down has left them on the defensive. BP refused to talk to Panorama. I tried to talk to the BP workers here to find out how long all this would take them. How many bags a day are you? Oh, no comment. Why, why no comment? Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing here? Have you been given instructions not to speak to the press? No. You have? By who? By the Pelicans. If openness can save face, it seems no one's told BP. Their handling of this has become a public relations fiasco. BP's accused of covering up the real size of the spill early on. Its promises to stop the leak have failed. The oil may keep gushing till August or even December, but BP's promises keep coming. We are here for the long haul. We are gonna clean every drop of oil off the shore. We will remediate any environmental damage and we will put the Gulf Coast right and back to normality as fast as we can. Down here, few trust what BP's chief executive, Tony Hayward, says anymore. Venice, Louisiana would normally be thriving at this time of year, but shrimping's been banned. The shrimp may not be fit for consumption. A.C. Cooper would normally be raking in $50,000 a month at this time of year. 
but all he's got so far is a $5,000 compensation payment from BP. How long have you been in the shrimping business? All my life. I'm 50 years. I'm 50 years old, probably been doing it since I was 15. And your family? My father still does it. He's 74. My two sons and my son-in-law. So we have a whole family that does it. What are they going to do? That's, that's more what my concern is. What are they going to do? I'm 50 years old. You know, I might have 20 more years left. Mm -hmm. They got the rest of their lives. That's where the problem is going to lie. Our heritage is going to be stopped right here. And, you're gonna, and it's a lot more than just all clean up. A lot more than just the industry. It's a heritage. It's a way of life. We're angry. We're mad. We're frustrated. One evening, we went to a gathering of shrimpers and fishermen nearby. People here accuse BP of penny pinching on compensation. We want BP to pay. Pay. As one of my clients said, and I'll be quiet, he said, you know what? I didn't go to the UK and dump my oysters at the headquarters of BP. But they sure as hell came to my oyster beds and dumped their oil. Pay up. BP's management has refused to accept all the blame. After all, the rig was owned by Transocean, and designs had been signed off by the federal government. President Obama himself was a backer of deep water drilling in the Gulf. Tony Hayward's protests didn't win him any public sympathy here, though. There's no one who wants this thing over more than I do, and I'd like my life back. Texas is the throbbing heart of America's oil industry. I went to Houston to try to find out why this disaster happened. America is the land of the lawyer, and BP's future may depend on what they did wrong. I was on my way to visit one very successful lawyer, Tony Busby. And guess how he rose to the top? By suing BP. BP has a terrible safety record here. As Texan lawyers say, BP's easy pickings. The company was fined over $100 million after safety errors in 2005 led to 15 deaths at its Texas City refinery. Tony Busby now represents 15 Deepwater Horizon rig workers, including Micah and Steve. BP, in my view, has a long history. and It's almost a, a callousness, uh, an indifference uh, to worker safety, the, a willingness to make decisions that put people's lives at risk, uh, all because they want to save themselves money. Same town, different lawyer. Jeff Seeley is acting for seven survivors. His clients are reluctant to talk openly about what went on on the rig. They're filing negligence cases against BP and the other companies involved. Explain some of the issues that y'all were having, let's say, in the 90 days before this happened. Um, well, I mean, we repeatedly got high numbers of gas I was allowed to listen in on some of the evidence. The picture it paints puts BP in the dock. I believe, based upon what I've seen and heard, is that's why this job was being rushed throughout this process. Was there a lot of pressure on the rig workers to get their jobs done quickly? Absolutely. Uh, they feel pressure on a daily basis, and particularly up to the time that this accident happened. About a mile beneath the sea under the rig lay a massive 450-ton device called a blowout preventer, or BOP. It's designed to completely seal the well within 60 seconds and prevent disaster. But on the night, the blowout preventer jammed and failed. The question is why. Tyrone Benton is suing BP and Transocean for negligence. He's never told this story before. He says his underwater robot identified problems with one of the pods that controls the blowout preventer weeks before. He said his supervisor informed BP and Transocean. We saw a leak um, on the pod. So by seeing the leak, we informed the company man. They have a control room where they could turn off that pod and turn on the other one so that they don't have to stop production. So they found a problem, and instead of fixing it, they just shut down the broken bit. Yes, they just shut it down and worked off another pod. Is it acceptable, in your view, to just shut down the broken part, in this case the control pod, and operate on just one control pod? As an engineer, I would say that's unacceptable. So what would you have to do if you wanted to really fix the blowout preventer? You'll have to stop production, bring the BLP completely up, and, um, 
and then start working on it. But they didn't do that? No, ma'am. Why not? Would that cost a lot of money? Um, my guess is yes. Tyrone doesn't know if the control pod was switched back on before April 20th. The U.S. Congress has found evidence that the blowout preventer also had unexpected problems, design faults, and a flat battery. Seriously, it's criminal. I mean, to the point that they must have known that the BOP was not in a position to operate that day. So if you have these sorts of Mother Nature events, things that are foreseeable, they know that these things are possible, they must have known that the BOP didn't have the ability that day to work. BP says Transocean was responsible for both the operation and maintenance of the BOP. Transocean said the BOP was tested three days before and worked. The makers of the device, Cameron, says its product has a long history of reliable performance. Congress says there were also fundamental design problems with the well, and that in several cases, BP took risks to save money, particularly when it came to the cement job used to seal the well. The cement in an oil well stops explosive gases from leaking up, so it's critical that the cement seals properly. As the rig began to sink the day after the disaster, Tyrone Benton was on the rescue boat. He had a conversation with the rig workers from Halley Burton, who'd just done the cement job. They said they were worried about it. They weren't happy with how um, the comp BP company man wanted them to do their cement job. Um, this, the cement job that they did was basically how the company man, the BP company man, wanted them to do it. And did your friends at Halliburton on the rig feel that the way they did the cement job, the way BP wanted it done, wasn't as safe, wasn't as good as what they would have done? They did make um, a comment that they wouldn't have done it that way. On April 20th, there were signs that gas could be seeping up through the concrete. There was a test BP could have done called a cement bond log, which could have determined if the cement job was safe, but it would have taken time and that costs. Was BP advised to do this test? As far as I can tell, BP was advised to do that test and chose not to do it. The pipe in the middle of the borehole has to be held absolutely straight, too, for the concrete to set properly. Devices called centralizers keep it straight. Congressional documents show BP was advised to use 21 of these devices. Instead, they use six. Professor Tad Pacek has pored over mountains of technical documents and testimony. My suspicion is that it was the cement um, uh, around the, lower, the lowest part of the well that somehow gave out and allowed the reservoir fluid, oil and gas, to flow in the space between the central tube and the outer tubes which is called the annular space. And so that, it wasn't a proper cement job, you're saying? So it was not probably a proper cement job, according to how I think about it. Halliburton, the company which was in charge of the cementing, has insisted that the cement slurry design was consistent with that used in similar applications. BP says it's investigating all these matters and that it had indications of a successful cementing operation. The nightmare for BP's top brass continues. They were hauled over the coals in the White House personally by President Obama. They appeared afterwards like miscreants before the world's press. I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to the American people on behalf of all the employees in BP. And I will take a couple of questions. Can, can, BBC, BBC can, can you, I want to ask you, did BP take safety shortcuts on the Deepwater Horizon to save money? We are going through a series of investigations, and we in the board, we will do our own independent investigation where we will scrutinize everything that we do to make sure that we understand the root cause of this 
tragic accident. You, excuse me, but you, you've been accused happen. of operating outside of industry standards. I have no further comments on that. But the chief executive, Tony Hayward, was forced to comment in Congress the next day. He's public enemy number one here. His stonewalling just made it worse. There's nothing that I've seen in the evidence so far that suggests that anyone put costs ahead of safety. If there are, then we'll take action. The price of all this for BP is catastrophic humiliation. For Steve Davis and the other rig workers, it's personal. We live it every day, as well as they do. Either one of us thought we never saw each other again, you know. I'm worried about next year. I'm worried about 10 years from now. There's a lot to worry about. With the sickness, with the shrimp, with the fish, to keep poisoning our gulf. As the oil starts to wash up on the white, sandy tourist beaches of Florida, and the worst hurricane season in years has been predicted, BP must wonder whether it was all worth it. The question is, will Britain's giant, already on its knees, survive the storm? <laughs>